Well, hello, New Life Church. So glad to have you joining us here on Easter Sunday, which Easter has become one of my favorite days, if not maybe my favorite day of the year. It focuses on the most hopeful and the best event in the life of Jesus. Imagine how like Twitter would just explode if a paramedic did CPR this afternoon on somebody who had died on Friday. The world would go nuts. It's also one of my favorite days because um, it's at the beginning of my favorite stretch of weather. The cold is behind us and there aren't any mosquitoes. Something that we get to enjoy for the next two weeks. <laughs> Maybe more than that. And then it's always fun. Easter Sunday is uh, to worship with more people in church, especially this year when we weren't able to enjoy being together um, for Easter in, two, in 2020. Back in, on Christmas, uh, over the Christmas holiday, I borrowed some puzzles from a friend because, uh, jigsaw puzzles, because Nia, or Diana and I, we, we love to do puzzles together. She does a lot of talking when we do that. She's really good at them. I think she puts in, in 100 pieces for about every 10 that I put in, so it's a, it can be pretty humiliating and humbling for me. Um, sure enough, we came to the end of the very first puzzle that we were going to be putting together, and there was a piece missing. We looked all over the floor. Nothing. Looked at the dog and thought, probably. So I decided that I would just go out and buy a new replacement puzzle for our friend. Puzzles cost $40. I, I mean, I, I value my friends, but seriously. I, so I decided what I was going to do is I was going to buy a used one, and then I was going to find the same piece, and I was just going to replace it. So it still cost me $20 to get a used one on eBay, um, went through individually all 1,000 pieces to try to find the one that would fit, that had the right pattern on it. And here's what I found out. They cut the puzzles differently. So I couldn't even find a piece that matched perfectly. So I just ended up giving the new used puzzle to my friend, hoping that it didn't come with the missing part. There is something very bothersome about a puzzle missing a piece. It's not complete. It's not whole. It's not right. Even a puzzle of a thousand pieces that's missing just one, having it be 99.9% .9 complete, leaves me thinking what a difference it would make if we just had that last little piece. I want to pivot now. Because we're on Easter weekend. And to consider that very first Easter weekend. At the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples, he tells them, that they are all going to abandon him in just a few hours. Peter, of course, responds to that. Boisterous Peter. He says in Matthew 26, verse 33, Even if all fall away on account of, of you, I never will. To which Jesus says, Oh yeah? By tomorrow morning, you're going to have de denied me three times already. And here's what we, we, what we read later while Jesus is literally being beaten by the, the most religious Jews that there were. Matthew 26, verse, starting at verse 69, says this. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard during Jesus' trial, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of, Naz of Galilee, she said. But Peter denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again, this time with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. How does a person totally abandon a best friend like that? Have you ever stepped back to consider what the three previous years had been like for Peter, the central figure among the disciples? Here's what the writers of the Gospels tell us. They tell us in Luke 5, that Peter's first encounter with Jesus was after a night of fishing when Jesus tells Peter and his companion to, to throw the nets into the deep water. They do that, and the catch was so great that their nets were ripping apart, and Peter decides he's going to follow Jesus. Peter had a front row seat at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. 
Right after that, in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law from a fever, which, if she was a nagging mother-in-law, Peter might not really, really have been happy about that. Peter handed out food to hundreds of people at the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6 and other Gospels. He was in the boat when Jesus, said to the, when Jesus spoke to the wind and a raging storm immediately stopped. That's in Luke chapter 8. He had heard Jesus explain the prophecies about him from the Old Testament and, and he'd seen Jesus expose the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. He had seen Jesus eat meals with IRS agents and with other misfits. Luke chapter 5 tells us about that. He had seen Jesus show compassion and save the life of the woman that was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. He saw Jesus heal so many people that they lost count. And on a missions trip that Peter went on with one of the other followers of Jesus, Peter himself healed people. Peter himself cast out demons. We learned that in Luke chapter 10. He watched Jesus raise their friend Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. And finally, who could forget Jesus himself, or Peter himself, had actually walked on the water in a raging storm with Jesus. As one of the disciples in Jesus's in, in Jesus's closest circle, I believe this. I believe that Peter experienced more astounding life events than anyone else in all of history, even more than Forrest Gump. Why then does Peter? denied Jesus repeatedly. Well, the first reason is certainly fear. If you've been paying attention to the trial that's taking place down in Minnesota right now about the floor, uh, George Floyd death, you know that a couple days ago the news reported that a potentially key witness in that trial was refusing to testify. I'd be hesitant too, knowing of the backlash that would come from people perhaps on both sides of that issue. When Jesus was arrested, Peter certainly remembered that not too, right about the same time, he had taken his sword and sliced off a guy's ear in the dark, and then he had run away. So he had to have known that he was also a wanted man. Fear was felt by all the disciples, from Jesus' arrest on through the trial and through the crucifixion, even to the point when after Jesus had died and probably the crowds had gone home and the Roman soldiers were picking up for the day and all, that, that all of the disciples, not, none of the disciples were uh, bold enough to go and to ask for the body of Jesus that they could prepare to be buried. Uh, it was two other guys, two other followers of Jesus that did not, that, not the key 11 disciples that were left. And on that first Easter, before the disciples had all seen Jesus, we're told in John chapter 20, verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them for fear of the Jews. Like them, fear causes us to live inconsistently with what we say we believe, because fear actually reveals what we genuinely believe down deep in our hearts. Peter denies Jesus because he's gripped by fear far more than his faith can overcome. And many of us are, are the same way. We're gripped by fear of what laws are going to be passed during this administration, We're gripped by fear of financial loss or fear that we're going to lose our job or gripped by fear of another wave of COVID and what that might mean for us. I'm convinced Peter denied Jesus first out of fear and then second because of flawed expectations. The excited crowds on Palm Sunday had lots of people seeing Jesus but thinking Messiah military messiah coming to overthrow Rome, which is why probably Peter had a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane in the first place. Of all the disciples, on January 6th of this year, when there was the mob of people at the Capitol and some entered, entered into the Capitol, Capitol building, of all the disciples, Peter would have been the one rushing in without thinking through all of the consequences. And we'd all be burying our heads thinking, oh no, now what is he doing? He's showing that he had faulty expectations, just like he did back in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter expects that Jesus is someone or something 
that Jesus definitely is not and is not planning to be. There is a missing piece that Peter doesn't have yet. I think flawed expectations were likely a part of Peter's denial because we live in a time where people have lots of flawed expectations about God or about his son Jesus or about what we would expect of them. God let my child get sick, as if God should heal every child. God didn't stop my brother from dying, as if God should stop the deaths of everybody. I prayed really hard, and my marriage still fell apart. God let the Vikings go 60 years without a Super Bowl win. So we have flawed expectations of what God should do, and that often affects our prayers, and it affects how we live our daily lives. And a third reason I think that Peter denied Jesus is that his faith wasn't yet locked down or wasn't yet buttoned up. It wasn't like completely formed and thought through and totally understood. There was so much confusion within Peter's heart, but also within the hearts of the other disciples. In fact, it's spoken about in all four of the Gospels in their rendering of what takes place that Easter weekend. Matthew 28, verse 17, um, just before Jesus ascends into heaven, so this is after, several weeks after Easter, uh, it says this, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. This is weeks after, they're still doubting. Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 14, later Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So their faith hasn't been formed perfectly yet here. Luke 24, verse 27. This is Easter Sunday afternoon with the two disciples walking away from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus. And it says this, And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, Jesus explained to these two disciples what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Why did Jesus explain it? Because it wasn't fully formed in their minds. And then John chapter 20, verse 9. This is just outside the empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning. Peter and John are there and it says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Fear, flawed expectations, and a faith that wasn't fully formed and and, and wasn't mature. That faith being mixed with confusion. These are the reasons that Peter denies Jesus. These are the reasons why on that Good Friday early morning, standing with that servant girl and she looks at him and says, this guy was with Jesus as well. Peter decides to unfollow Jesus. There's one more verse I want us to look at today. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, After 30 years of Peter being beaten and arrested, harassed, and persecuted for being one of Jesus' greatest spokespersons, one of Jesus' biggest cheerleaders, this is what Peter writes to Christians in northern Turkey. He says this, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. A reason for the hope that you have. During these weeks, we've been studying in 1 Peter as, as in a series I'm calling Hope Verse 2021. And Peter says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So imagine a conversation where we're able to sit down with Peter and say, so Peter, what is your hope? And this is what I think he'd say. I think Peter would say, well, it wouldn't be in the miracles, as amazing as they were, like all those fish that we caught, or the storm being calmed, or the feeding of 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. It wouldn't even be in the miracle of me being able to walk on water with Jesus. That's not the reason for my hope. And while I believe everything in the Old Testament that Jesus explained, like the prophecies that he fulfilled, the the stories of creation and the flood and Moses and the Exodus bringing the people of the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt. Those aren't the source of my hope either, not even close. And it's not the healings I saw either, even seeing Lazarus walk out of a tomb after being wrapped up like a mummy for four days. I did or saw 
or learned or believed all of those things and had a front row seat for them. I had lived that for three years by Jesus' side, day and night. And still, when that little girl accused me of being with Jesus, I still denied him. I still unfollowed him. No, the reason for my hope is not in any of those things. The reason for my hope is in the resurrection. That was the missing piece that I needed that made everything else come together, that made sense of all that I had heard and seen of Jesus and everything that we had done together during those three years. Jesus proved when he rose from the dead exactly what he had said to Lazarus' sister just before Lazarus was raised from the dead, where Jesus says in John 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Jesus died to forgive me of my sins. Who loves like that, Peter would say. And then Jesus came back to life to prove that he could conquer death. I saw him with my own eyes. Who's got that kind of power? When I knew that, that's when I chose to refollow him. And he didn't reject me for my greatest failure when I wanted to follow him again. Who else would I follow? Those three years of following Jesus and living all those amazing events had still left Peter unprepared for what would have been among the worst things that could happen, to be arrested, beaten, perhaps tried, and maybe executed himself. And if there's anything that we've learned from this COVID year, it's that America and the entire world were unprepared for the worst as well. The World Health Organization was caught off guard. Virtually every nation's governments floundered in how to respond to a pandemic the likes of, of which they'd never seen before. In America, Democrats and Republicans alike were constantly guessing what to do and making numerous mistakes and failures along the way. Lives were lost. Jobs disappeared. Many people's long-term health has diminished as a result of this. And people are struggling emotionally and mentally in unprecedented ways, many of them trying to escape through alcohol, partially because we had placed our confidence in things that weren't designed to withstand the worst that life could throw at us. You don't need hope for just your present life situations or for when times are really going well. Most of the time for us, life is pretty manageable. Life is pretty positive. You don't need hope for those reasons. You need, or for those situations, you need hope for the most challenging and fear-producing situations that you will ever have to face. Peter was unprepared, but we don't need to be. Jesus makes it clear. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he or she dies. And the two most critical things to believe and to act on are, number one, he died on Good Friday to pay the penalty for your sins so you could be forgiven while he gets punished. And then the second most important thing to believe is this, that on Easter Sunday morning, he walked alive out of that grave to prove that not even death is more powerful than he is. If not him, who else would you follow? Nothing else. Not anything in our other Christian beliefs, as important as they are, nothing else is worthy of our greatest hope. You see, before the resurrection, When Jesus was under trial, even with all those amazing experiences that Peter had, he walked away from Jesus. He denied Jesus. He abandoned Jesus. I think he closed the door on faith. It's all over, and I was wrong. Fear of a young girl overwhelmed Peter, even with all he had seen in amazing ways over those last three years. But after the resurrection, just 
weeks after the resurrection. He ends up speaking, preaching to a massive crowd that had gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. It was the next great feast. And later on, to the high, before the high priest and all of the key leaders, he speaks about who Jesus really was and he accuses all of them of murder. Fearlessly so. What makes a man change like that? Only the resurrection. I encourage you today, if you haven't already done so, to make the reason for Peter's hope the reason for your hope. If you've never taken that most important first step of faith in Christ, I'd like to to give you the opportunity to do so today. Starting with to just admit that you have sinned. And then to ask Jesus to forgive your sins along with all the sins of other people that he died on the cross for. And then finally, to declare to him that you trust him, that just like he was raised from the dead and triumphed over death, you too, after you die, will triumph over death and be able to live with him in heaven throughout all of eternity. If you would like to take that step today, then I'm going to pray in just a moment, and I'm going to pray in short phrases, and right where you are, if you have not prayed a prayer similar to this, indicating that you want to become a follower of Jesus Christ, right where you are, you can just pray silently following after my phrases. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I need to admit that I am a sinner. I have broken your rules. I have missed your expectations on me. And I am guilty of sin. I thank you that you sent Jesus into this world. I believe what is written about him in the Old Testament. I believe that he died on the cross and that he paid the penalty for my sins. I ask you, Father, to forgive me of my sins and to place the penalty of them on Jesus. I confess them before you, and I want to live in a way that honors you and blesses you. And today I also declare that I believe Jesus rose again from the dead, that he was victorious over sin and victorious over death. And because he still lives, I know I can too. Come into my heart. Give me the life that Jesus has. Help me to follow after you. Thank you for being my Savior. I commit myself to be your child and your follower. And I ask you this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you've just prayed that prayer, I hope that you will continue to follow after Jesus. Part of that is regularly worshiping with other followers of Jesus Christ. If you live here in the Aiken area, we would love to have you join us on a week-by-week basis. Next week, we'll have worship starting at 1030. And from then on, we'll be having worship each week at 1015 and then evening worship also at 5.30. We'd be glad to have you join us. God bless you and have a great day.